Well, welcome to AUSA Now, the Association of the United States Army's 66th Annual Meeting and Exposition. I'm Lieutenant General Retired Victor Michael. Good afternoon. On behalf of our panel chair, Dr. Bruce Jetty, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Technology, Technology, It is unmuted. On behalf of our panel, Dr. Bruce Jetty, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Applications Technology, General Ed Daly, the CG of U.S. Army Material Command, and our distinguished panel, I'd like to thank the Association of the United States Army for putting together this virtual annual meeting. And for all that it does for our, army, our soldiers and civilians. Yeah. I'm on I'm on mute. And my mic was working. Welcome to AUSA Now, the Association of the United States Army's 66th Annual Meeting and Exposition. I'm Lieutenant General Retired. Good afternoon. On behalf of our panel chair, Dr. Bruce Jetty, the Assistant Secretary of the Army, Logistics and Technology, General Ed Daly, the CG of U.S. Army Material Command, and our distinguished panelists. I'd like to thank the Association of the United States Army for putting together this virtual meeting. And for all that it does every day, its soldiers and civilians and their families. We are pleased to present this contemporary military flag panel on the critical subject of having deliberate change in the industrial grade base through innovation, vision, and cooperation. Our Army must have a healthy industrial base in order to ensure total force dominance now and into the future. To address this important topic, Dr. Jetty and the Association of the United States Army have assembled a strong and experienced team. General Ed Daly, Commanding General U.S. Army Material Command, Brigadier General Vince Malone, Joint Program Executive Officer of Armaments and Ammunition, Dr. Arun Sarah, Professional Staff Member Armed Services Committee, and Mr. Jay Douglas, Chief Operating Officer for the Advanced Robotics and Manufacturing Institute. After our panel chair and each panel member offer short comments, we'll leave about 20 minutes for your questions. To ask a question, please use the chat function on your screen. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, coming into uh, this, uh, this session of being able to discuss the uh, organic industrial base. Uh, so let me go ahead and get started so we give uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, so if you could bring up the first uh, slide. Uh, so safety, safety for the workforce. Number one of uh, our number one priority is rooted is rooted in the fact that our facilities that we currently have in the organic industrial base, let me let me lay them out for you really quickly if you're not especially familiar with them. Uh, we have GoGo's and GoCo's. GoCo's go are government owned, government operated. GoCo's are government owned, contractor operated. The vast majority of my comments today will stem from the GoCo's. Uh, those GoCo's are Halston, Radford, Lake City, Iowa Army Ammunition Plant, and Scranton. Um, during the course, I'll, uh, if I touch on one particularly, I can explain what it is. We have two GO-GOs, which are operated, uh, those, those GO-COs are fundamentally operated by the PEO. Uh, GO-GOs, McAllister and Pine Bluff are fundamentally operated by uh, Army Materiel Command. And I know that uh, General Daly will have uh, uh, some additions, additional things to discuss there. 
These facilities were developed in the 1940s uh, in support of World War II. And they, if you were to visit them, uh, are technologies that are rooted in the 1940s. Uh, it doesn't mean that the technologies are poor, nor that we did anything to not improve them. Uh, there are, in fact, a good number of improvements have been made to these facilities, uh, some of them technical, uh, most of them policies and procedures. Uh, and I think one of the most important ones is uh, a d disciplined workforce that always functions in compliance with those policies and procedures for safe operations. Um, However, even with the safe operations complying with the policies and procedures, we've had three deaths at the organic industrial base facilities that go COS uh, in the last 10 years. Um, the, the low number is in part due to this disciplined operation that, that we, um, I'm talking about. Uh, but still, all deaths are tragic, and we must work to eliminate any possible cause of, of, uh, of deaths. Um, I, I'm going to mention the names of each of the people and the basic circumstances behind each of them because I think that their, their uh, sacrifice in trying to pursue that which the uh, uh, Army needs for its uh, ability to fight and win the nation's wars uh, are uh, something that we should remember. Uh, Andrew Goad uh, uh, died in a propellant fire on 11 June 2018 at uh, Radford, uh, doing exactly what he was supposed to do. Uh, Lawrence Bass uh, died in a tetrazine um, uh, fire uh, when a primer exploded on 11 April 2017 at Lake City Army Ammunition Plant. Uh, Troy Snatt uh, died in an excavation rollover working on the facility, but not specifically directly with the, um, the munitions production uh, itself. So how do we actually uh, leverage the fact that we're doing modernization when, when in fact, as you can see um, on the next slide, we not, need not to just simply modernize, but to, to transform. So transformation, not modernization, is where we need to go. We have done, as I said, a large number of modernizations. It still hasn't prevented all possible accidents. We need to relook facilities. We need to relook contracting. We need to look relook our organizational relationships. I'll mention that in a second. We need to relook. Re do we have a difference in the way we behave at a go-co versus a go-go? And we re need to relook the finances and management of them. Get people away from the energetics. There's no reason they have to be there anymore with the technologies. Robotic operations, modular batch processing, fault tolerance through um, multiple lines and reconfigurable uh, uh, production lines with batch control and better testing. We need assured supply. Next, next uh, uh, slide. Uh, material sources are not always available from the U.S. And, and not economically available from the U.S. We need a path to assured U.S. sources if possible. We need to accept price uh, uh, differences. This is a discussion we can have about uh, Congress's support. We need to develop uh, production at the OIBs for some critical components and work with the environmental cost implications. Uh, and we need to examine new sources for capabilities versus chemicals. Some of the things we, we buy, maybe we could not need anymore if we developed alternatives. And finally, the, the, the thing I'd like to highlight at the bottom there is a foundation. You see, there, there was often this tension between the ASALT based PEO structure and AMC, when in fact, uh, we've tried to, uh, General Daly and I have tried to work very diligently to uh, make that a transition between the two with a clear uh, definition between uh, what, what is the responsibility of the PEO and what's the responsibility of, of AMC and the Joint Munitions Command. Um, all of these things are coming together to give us a very uh, sound base and uh, something to build on. And I'll hold my comments from this point on and allow uh, the others to talk and to um, take questions as you uh, provide. Thank you. General Ed Daly. General Paul Mike, sir, can you hear me over? I can hear you, sir, yes. Okay, great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, let me start by thanking General Ham and AUSA for this year's annual virtual meeting and for what they do to support our soldiers, veterans, 
Army civilians and their families each and every day. I have one slide, if we could pull up that slide. Um, so first, uh, to echo what Bruce Jenny just talked about, I'm truly honored to participate with Dr. Jenny, General Paul Micah, and fellow panel members to discuss the Army's organic industrial base. As Dr. Jetty stated, the purpose of the OIB is really threefold. One, to enable current readiness. Two, to modernize, to sustain future weapons platforms. And three, to support future COCOM wartime surge requirements when and if required. Within Army Material Command, we take our roles and responsibilities very, very seriously based on command authorities given to us through Title 10, Secretary McCarthy and General McConville and Army regulations. And just to refresh people's memory, that includes responsibility for manufacturing, production, distribution, storage, surveillance, strategic divestiture, and demilitarization, as well as mission command of depot, arsenals, uh, infrastructure, and energy programs across the OIB. My relationship with both the Army G4 and Dr. Jetty in support of his role as both the Army's acquisition executive and the single manager for conventional munition, uh, the Simca, is critical. And I will tell you unequivocally that we're 100 percent synced. There's no daylight between us, as he mentioned. Uh, based on the guidance of the Secretary of the Army and the Chief, Dr. Jetty and I are committed to developing a 15-year comprehensive holistic strategy, as he mentioned, more transformational than just focused on modernization across the entire OIB for the Army. We're setting a new paradigm for driving revolutionary transformation. And you can see from the slide the four lines of effort in support of both Army priorities and the campaign objectives through Army 2024 and beyond. Today's organic industrial base includes 26 depots, arsenals, ammunition plants, and medical repair facilities valued at more than $40 billion. And as Dr. Jetty mentioned, split between GoGo's and GoCo's. GoCo's number eight, uh, and GoGo's are 18 in number. Within the workforce of more than 32,000 skilled artisans uh, crossing state lines, 17 states, uh, these sites directly impact readiness not only for the Army, but for the Joint Force and many portfolios, such as C5ISR. And last year, the OIB executed about $4.6 billion in workload that impacted tactical readiness across the force. As you know, most of the OIB facilities are designed and built uh, during World War II era, era, as Dr. Jetty mentioned. Moving forward, incremental and piecemeal upgrades will not get us the modernized and transformational OIB we need to transform the antiquated, unreliable, ineffective machinery and, and facilities. We need a holistic, long-term investment strategy. Now, I will say we've made some impacts over the past 10 years. We've made progress. And a few examples of 21st century investments that support both current and future modernization efforts include an investment of nearly $400 million in a nitrocellulose facility in Radford, uh, the, the base ingredient uh, of the majority of DOD propellants uh, the second is an energy efficient powertrain facility with state of the art engine test cells at the Aviation Depot, Corpus, Corpus Christi, Texas. At Lake City Ammunition Plant, upgrades for primer, cartridge, and bullet manufacturing with 21st century technology and continued planning for new construction to support the next generation squad weapon ammunition requirement. And at Waterbury Arsenal, uh, rotary forge and chrome plating facility as well as double carriage uh, lays to, to enhance capabilities in support of the extended range cannon artillery gun tubes. Tied to modernization uh, of the infrastructure is streamlining OIB processes and pursuing new state-of-the-art equipment. We're integrating a number of cutting edge technologies, including co computer program logic, robotics, AI, maintenance analytics, and prognostic sensors for our equipment. And additive manufacturing, and subtractive manufacturing capabilities have been installed at 14 sites across the OIB with Rock Island as the current center of excellence. And as I mentioned, while we've made significant progress in investment to the tune of about $5 billion uh, since 2009, there's still much to do. We're committed to the protection of, and safety of our workforce, the protection of our critical capabilities, reducing our single points of failure, as well as decreasing reliance on foreign suppliers. 
So I'll stop there. I look forward to your questions again. Uh, thanks. It's an honor to be part of this panel. Thank you, General Daly. And now, Brigadier General Rick Malone. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It truly is great to be with you here today to discuss how we are driving deliberate change in the industrial base. As you've heard at its core, the vision that Dr. Jetty and General Daly have laid out is centered on an industrial based strategy that will ensure the safety of the OIB workforce, transform processes and equipment, and strengthen supply chain resiliency. As an essential element in achieving this vision, we must develop a strategic sourcing plan focused on supply chain resiliency. JPO product managers have launched a campaign to deep dive into sources of supply and points of failure. They're identifying priority efforts and driving solutions to address risk. In areas that cover multiple organizations or cross military services, we're pulling that validation process and solution development up to the PEO headquarters level for increased visibility and coordination. All along the way, we must foster practices that drive innovative solutions to emerging risks. Success will require new manufacturing processes, alternate materials, and novel end product pathways to aid in manufacturability, so that in the end, supplies can be sourced domestically or by strategic partners. We are assembling scientists and engineers from across the S&T community with expertise in chemistry, energetics, and manufacturing to address these challenges. This is a big effort and not one that we can do nor should do in isolation. Continued collaboration with our teammates in Armored Material Command is an essential component to the success of this endeavor. Our partners at the Joint Munition Command bring the expertise needed in developing a common operating picture of our global supply chain and the associated logistical challenges. Their decades of experiences is allowing us to hit the ground running. We're gaining momentum by further developing the relationships with our industry partners. A seamless understanding of both the commercial and government supply chain down to component and even raw material level is needed to develop safe, secure, and readily available supplies to ensure not only the peacetime requirements, but also our wartime needs. Our industry partners possess unique expertise and insights into the problem set, and we welcome their involvement in finding solutions that benefit both the organic and the commercial industrial base. We cannot forget our international partners and the capabilities they offer, not just from a manufacturing perspective, but from a geographical supply chain look as well. Their insights and continued partnership is critical to our assessment and planning. Lastly, we could not accomplish this without the continued support of Congress. So together, the vision and the team will drive innovation and lead us to the desired end state of transformational change across the industrial base. We will harness technology and embrace novel solutions to enable ever safer operations and enhance supply chain resiliency. The nation's industrial base assets that ensure the readiness of the joint force today will remain viable to meet the needs of the force of 2035 and beyond. It's a lot to do and it won't be easy, but we have a team that will rise to the challenge. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today and I look forward to answering your questions. And thank you, General Malone. And now, Dr. Arun Terrell. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I just want to start with the standard disclaimer that my remarks represent my own views and not the views of the committee or the Congress as a whole. Um, in listening to um, the three speakers before me, I'm encouraged to hear that the Army is focusing in on the challenges of modernizing the organic industrial base for those important Army missions. Um, and I think I, I have a few questions and observations I think that would come from the congressional perspective. At the top level, you know, are we creating a system by which we are encouraging, investing in, incorporating those new technologies that are actually going to modernize the organic industrial base? Um, for example, you know, are we looking at the requirements process and is it really driven to transform the system or is it driven to do incremental improvements to the system? Is it really looking at those maybe not so exciting but smaller technologies 
that can have a big impact on performance of the industrial base and especially cost savings. Um, when we think about the partnerships that are so critical in this area, which, which are driven by the fact that many of these technologies are dual use and commercial in nature, uh, are, is the Army making use of all the authority that Congress has given to it under acquisition reform, under the Centers for Industrial and Technical Excellence to share um, people, to share intellectual property, to share facilities with the private sector to push forward Army missions? Um, for example, um, we've got good models by which we can cooperate with our uh, foreign partners under things like the Foreign Comparative Test Program. Should there be something like that on the domestic side to look at uh, advanced domestic technologies that maybe we could incorporate into the industrial base and, and potentially disrupt the way we're doing business? Um, Similarly, we have a system by which we have energy savings performance contracts to in, in, encourage investment in energy savings technology and share in the savings with the private sector. So we have a similar model for operations to be a way of sharing and saving. Um, I think that uh, the other thing we need to think about is how we invest in our people, the people who operate these facilities, the, those artisans who work in all of those obscure engineering and technology areas. Um, when we're serious about a technical area, we really honor its workforce, as we can see the Army doing in software, right? Um, are we doing the same things for the organic industrial base? Are we serious about increasing our spending and infrastructure spending? Are we increasing, serious about encouraging training and retraining that workforce? Are, are we serious about honoring the talent through investment and through senior leader attention to the important work that they're doing? So in this, if we could uh, bring up the same enthusiasm, the same kinds of ideas, the same kinds of steps that the Army's using today to modernize the software processes, I think we could make a lot more progress in looking at our industrial base. And I'll finish with just thinking about procurement. Um, we're very comfortable in investing R&D dollars and even manufacturing dollars to shore up industrial bases. Um, I'm not sure we do enough on the R&D side ever. So I continue to say we can do more with SDIR and SDIR to shore up the industrial base, just like General Wells was talking about. I think the thing we need to think hard about is the procurement dollars. Uh, companies want procurement. They want the revenue to, uh, to stabilize them, to grow their businesses. It's a natural follow-on to our spending on R&D and Mantech type money. Um, but we really don't have the policy in place Target our procurement dollars at those kinds of companies, those domestic suppliers, those parts of the industrial base that we can use those in procurement dollars to stand up and protect those industrial bases to shore up our supply chain security, to keep them more resilient against financial distress. So, uh, just to summarize, I'm thinking about pushing on partnerships, to, to honoring the people, and to better use the procurement dollars. I think those kinds of steps will help shore up our industrial base. I look forward to the questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Serafin. If I could ask the panel if you would move your mics if you're not, so we don't get feedback from the, person, our, the panelists that are speaking. And now, uh, Mr. J. Thank, thank you, uh, General Formica, and it's an honor to be a member of this uh, this panel today. Um, I represent the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute. We're one of uh, 15 manufacturing innovation institutes, and we focus in robotics. Uh, robots are great in the manufacturing space for dealing with dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks. They make things a lot safer for the workforce. You can see on this chart that we work a across a broad range of areas, technical areas, as well as improving workforce issues uh, for the supply chain. Uh, we represent an organization, a public-private partnership of 275 organizations. These are large aerospace companies, some of the biggest universities. startups uh, that are involved in some of the most innovative robotic solutions available today. Uh, we do 
uh, we operate through a series of project calls. We work with our partners in the DOD and our members to come up with the ideas and the problems that are most necessary for solution. Uh, we've been able to work very rapidly from problem definition all the way through funding of the project, most recently within a period of about six to eight weeks. Uh, we have been able to respond to some of the pandemic issues uh, very quickly just this past six months. Um, we are an asset uh, to the national economy, but specifically to those in the DOD that are trying to solve manufacturing and innovation problems rapidly with the best that the United States economy has to offer. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, I'm honored to be here and looking forward to your questions. And uh, thank you, Dr. Douglas. Uh, Mr. Douglas, excuse me. So we've heard from diverse perspectives on this very important topic. And as we wait for your questions to end, I'd like to start off with a question that perhaps Dr. Jenny would like to uh, respond to, maybe General Daly, other members of the panel. But you've laid out the need for transformative change and an aggressive approach or a vicious approach anyway. We know that the Army can't do that on its own. What support from Congress and from OSD do you need for this kind of change? So, um, so I, I, I appreciate the question and uh, let, me, let me see if I can touch base really quickly on it. Um, so I give others, others a chance to weigh in. Um, uh, one of the things I wanted to make sure that we were doing was seeing Congress as a partner in this process. Um, to change the organic industrial base is uh, a big challenge. It tends to be, you know, it's, it tends to be kind of not thought of as the pointy end of the spear, yet everything at the pointy end of the spear is dependent upon the, 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 this, this base uh, at the back end of the spear. That, that's called the organic industrial base. Um, because of that, since February, um, I, I've been working with the congressional staffers uh, on a weekly, every, about every other week, uh, we meet on uh, phone con and just discuss things. One of the things I've raised a number of times has been this organic and industrial base issue and the modernization challenges that we have. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking with uh, General Daly and us trying to take a look at what our current state of affairs are and how we might be able to move forward. There's an existing plan from, for 2025 uh, that was written in 2016 that, that is basically, as I said, modernization, not transformation. And so what we did was we said we needed to generate a hearing which begins to lay a foundation for cooperation between the Army and, and the congression, congressional committees on how we can get a revised variant to our um, uh, to our efforts, move it from modernization to transformation. Um, not all of it is money. Uh, there are environmental issues. There are optimization issues. For example, most of our our efforts right now are optimization associated with the cost of the ammunition we procure. How do we make sure we have the most ammo for the dollars we spend? The problem with that is it drives us to the least expensive commodities that go into the ammo. When you do that, sometimes that's offshore. If I want to move it onshore, it changes, uh, it, it becomes more challenging because then I end up involved with either uh, a more expensive product from a commercial entity that may produce it, or if there's no current production in the United States, um, usually that's tied to um, environmental issues and a much more expensive facility to establish a capability. So the optimization is, do I want to optimize our assured uh, munitions or do I want to optimize our price of munitions? To deal with that, I'm going to have to have Congress involved. Uh, and by the way, Ar Arun, I, I took notes because you gave some good good suggestions. Uh, yes, I, I could jump in if that's okay. Yeah, please. 
Yeah, uh, so first, uh, so just to tag on to what Dr. Jenny said, um, again, um, I think he and I are 100% synced on this. Um, but first, let me just say that we truly uh, appreciate the support of both Congress and OSD, uh, especially as we um, look at this uh, effort for a 15-year transformational modernization strategy uh, based on the guidance from the SEC Army and the Chief of Staff. Um, uh, but there's five areas where I think we need assistance. Uh, one is continued direct hiring authorities uh, for our workforce. As somebody mentioned, uh, it's really the corner, cornerstone of our OIB. We really appreciate the extension uh, out to 2025 of those authorities. They're really making a difference. But as we really transform the OIB for the future, it doesn't mean a reduction of personnel. What it really means is realigning skills and attributes uh, to, to the new workload, uh, which will be now involving robotics, et cetera. The second thing is continued advocacy for partnerships. Um, whether they're public-private or public-public uh, partnerships, as you know, uh, we have about 350 of those uh, partnerships valued at about $250 million. Those are critical, along with the armament retooling and manufacturing support arms, which is really, as many people know, uh, essentially leasing at, uh, at GOCO's uh, underutilized capability. Uh, so that's necessary going forward. Uh, and then uh, support for natural gas extraction, not only to get to net zero at some of our locations and installations, but to be able to increase revenue for the Department of Defense. Uh, and then lastly, and quite frankly, probably the most important is timely, adequate, and predictable funding. And I would add, without penalization for carryover, which directly affects workload readiness and workforce levels. Uh, so I think those are the five areas that we've appreciated the support of both Congress and OSD, and we just have to continue to get that going forward if we're going to realize both the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army's vision for this 15-year strategy going forward. Dr. Serafin, would you like to comment? I think um, all of those items that uh, that are, have been raised so far, I think Congress could be supportive of. Um, I think it's open and continuous dialogue on what's needed to support the depots, to support the industrial base that's going to be important. You got to remember, these are very important constituents to the members of Congress, and they've generally tried to do what they can to support them. Um, if the Army is showing an interest in actually modernizing the facilities, uh, investing in the workforce, I think the Congress would be very supportive. On the, on the notion of uh, budgetary reform, I think that's key for all acquisition reform, whether we're talking about organic industrial base or, or industrial base more broadly. I think that's also a place where we, we haven't really gotten into a good conversation between the executive branch and the legislative branch on the steps that can be taken. So, for example, um, from a congressional perspective, we, we understand the technology and threat is changing by the day. It's hard for us to understand why it takes multiple years for the executive branch to develop a, a budget request, uh, given that technology and threat are changing by the day. Uh, when, that, when that request is delivered to the Hill in early in the year, in January and February, um, it's hard for us to understand why we can't work with the executive branch to adjust that budget request as technology and, sh and threat are changing so that we get it right on the day of appropriation. So I think that kind of partnership with the, between the Hill and the executive branch would result in appropriations that are more timely and more relevant to technology and threat. And we just have to sort of come out of our, our trenches and work together to produce the best possible uh, appropriations at the, at the end of the appropriations process. Thanks. Thank you, uh, panelists. I appreciate your responses. I'd like to direct the next question first to General Wall. And then to uh, to add to this question. This question comes in from the audience. In the ammunition business, we've been addressing single failure for decades, yet they remain. We've assumed risk for a long time. What do your timeline and cost estimates indicate for this kind of issue? In other words, how are we going to address those? 
Great. General Formica, you're coming in a little broken. Could you repeat the last bit of that question, please? Yes. The last thing I was we've assumed risk for a long time. What does your timeline and cost estimates indicate for this initiative? Okay, so I tried, as I tried to indicate in uh, my remarks, uh, we've initiated action now. You know, we're, we are prioritizing uh, those single points of failure that we've identified so far, as well as our sources of supply, the most critical ones we're getting after now. But I see this being a journey, a long-term journey, as we continue to uh, drill down into our supply chain. So I think what this is gonna require is at least a 15-year strategy. And that strategy will evolve over time as we learn more and more about our supply chain and, and we continue to develop risk reduction um, methodologies and answers to address those supply chain risks. And I hope that Thank answers you. the question. Thank you. Does anybody else want to chime in? General Mike, uh, Paul Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, so I'd be, I would add to, to what Vince said. Uh, so just a couple other things for consideration as we look at this 15-year strategy, and Jen, uh, Dr. Jenny and I have discussed this, is uh, single points of failure that exist in terms of capabilities within the organic industrial base currently. That's within the confines of the ins installations. And so, uh, one, I think we have to look at going forward potential redundancies, um, first off. The second piece is protection uh, in ways that we haven't thought of before. Uh, to include expanding our thoughts to protection uh, from a cyber domain perspective. Uh, and so those are the pieces that I would just add on to Vince's point, uh, because I think it's a valid question as we go forward with this 15-year strategy. Okay, thank you. I'd like to direct the question to any of the panelists who would like to hear from as part of this. Since the pace of change is accelerating at a rate that our systems and organizations cannot be set up to accommodate, how can we organize in a way that leverages resident capability and knowledge in harnessing commercial available expertise and experience? And Mr. Douglas, your part of that would be how can we leverage commercially available expertise and experience? Thank you. I think that's a great question. Uh, one of the key things is it's not always just about the fancy technology solution. Quite often, the system, the business model, and the organization has to change too. There's a lot of innovation that goes into the thinking of not just what a fancy robot can do, but how the organization itself has to operate. So I think that's a key challenge that is, as people and leaders of these organizations, you must always be cognizant of, of the broad dimensions of these problems. Uh, Dr. Jetty? Yeah, so it's a great question. So, and, and, and I, I really appreciate, uh, you know, ha having our industry partner uh, be able to be on the panel, and frankly, the the desire to 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 uh, not just have us uh, closed form inside the government uh, was specifically to show that the army is um, is looking very hard at trying to find a way to do uh, to leverage uh, the, these type of technologies. Um, I, I I made a point uh, in in my little opening remarks uh, that when modernization is not what we're pursuing, we're pr pursuing transformation. What do we mean by transformation? It, it, it isn't that I wanna do the way we've been doing it better, it's I wanna get a new way of doing what we want to get done under a new set of parameters. I want this modularity. Right now we produce high explosives at Halston in a 550 pound batch. If any one of them goes up, we lose a building. If I could produce it in faster, so I'm still producing at the same total rate, 
uh, one pound batch segregated from others that if one pound was to go up, it would not cause conflagration of the entire facility or loss of a building, but only the loss of that explosive. It's a better design. You do that all in an automated fashion so that that the that the people involved don't have to come in physical contact with explosives throughout the production process and then only only in a point of packing and safe operations at that end would they come in contact with it. Um, fault tolerance, multiple lines, uh, reconfigurability, uh, batch control, all of these are modern concepts inside of um, how you build uh, industrial complexes today, uh, which are different than how we've looked at it in the past. And that's one reason as we begin to move forward, much as General Daly has said in this uh, pursuit of a 15-year plan, we're going to be looking for industrial partners that, that can operate the plants, but they may, may not be the people who build the plants. Because the people who build the plants may be chemical companies or other manufacturing capabilities uh, that are brought to bear, uh, like the robotic systems. So we're looking at a, a, a much more responsible way for us at the at, at, in the Army senior leadership to take ownership of the transformational uh, character of what we're doing, have the responsibility of selecting the right people to do the different portions of our transformational change, and then implementing those um, those efforts to truly make transformational change occur in the kind of the context I was I was mentioning earlier. Thank you, sir. We've got about three together to answer this. The secretary and the team have prioritized people. The question is, how do we select and retain the necessary workforce to maintain the industrial base? General Daly, first to you, sir, and General Long. Hey, General Pomica, you, you came in broken. Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, and I apologize for that. Um, I said that the Secretary, can you hear me now, General Daly? I, I can, I can, sir. Thanks. The Secretary and the Chief have prioritized people. How do we attract and retain the necessary workforce to achieve what you achieve in the industrial base? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and I think it's really two lines of effort. Uh, one is to continue to invest in the current artisan workforce that we have running our organic industrial base at present. 32,000, as we mentioned, uh, constantly making sure that we are training and educating them, protecting them from a safety perspective uh, in all we do. Um, and uh, enabled by the direct hire authority that lets us continue to recruit uh, the right skill sets. Going forward, um, preserving the workforce in terms of numbers, but realigning their skills to a modernized approach in the organic industrial base. Uh, sometimes people think uh, that we say modernization or transformation, that's code for reduction of a workforce. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about recruiting different skill sets that can help work robotics and AI and computer programming logic, et cetera. Uh, and so it's paramount that, you know, our, our direct hire authorities continue, uh, but, but the complexion and the skills and knowledge of our workforce will change over time. Uh, and that really gets at to the, what the secretary and the chief were talking about in terms of maintaining the fact that our workforce, uh, our soldiers, our DA civilians, and workforce uh, that comes to work each and every day in the OIB uh, is taken care of um, and that we look to the future in terms of them making great contributions. Thank you, sir. General Malone, would you want to add on to that? Yeah, thank you, General Formica, because that is a very important question. Because, you know, in order to get the solutions we're going to need uh, to address new materials, novel end products, it's going to take the expertise of our workforce. Not just the workforce we have today, but the workforce 
that we will grow over the years. We need expertise in chemistry, energetics, and manufacturing, and those are all in high demand at an industry. So how do we attract and retain that talent to our team? And the feedback that we get from our employees that they enjoy the most is they enjoy the challenges that they get to work on in the Army, and then they enjoy the autonomy that they have in making a difference. And so that is something that we have to leverage to our advantage. And in this case, we're talking about a strategy that we will be working on for over 15 years. So this is an opportunity of the workforce to get on board and to make a difference over the course of, the, uh, of their career. And I think that is something that will resonate well with them. We have to attract this workforce. We need to take advantage of um, opportunities we have to bring those college, that college talent in and introduce them to what we do in the Army and what we do here at uh, Picatinny Arsenal to get them interested in it. Um, and we have internship programs. We need to continue to leverage those. We need, once we get them on board, we need to continue to, mo to uh, mentor uh, those, that talent and, and, make, and, and allow them the opportunity to move up the chain so that they see the career progression and they believe they're on a path to success in the organization. Okay, thank you very much. We have a little over a minute left. So I would like to thank the panel for their preparation, their thoughtful comments, and their responses to your questions. And of course, we thank you for your attention and participation. I'd like to give Dr. Jenny the opportunity to the panel. Sure. So, so I'm going to put two quick words in on the on the last question because I think it's really important people are our greatest asset and that's why I led with it as my uh, uh, my uh, my in my comments uh, this includes all the way down to the PMs and their education program we're going to be shaping some people by their proper education so that they they know how to work industry better um, and and we're going to transform the workforce not replace it. So there, there, uh, there are good things in store to, for the workforce as well. I want to thank everybody for uh, support and attending. All the, all the people on the other side of the screen, it's a little bit odd not knowing, uh, but thank you very much for your help and, and opportunity to present.